good morning, everybody. Well, I hope you're ready to get into God's Word here. Today we are going to continue our study on the book of Acts. So about four weeks ago we started this study. We covered Acts chapter 1. Uh, today we're going to continue on to Acts chapter 2. Amen? What a phenomenal time we had at the GLC. I personally remember moving to Portland my first time in ministry and leading a small group of remnant disciples, uh, 13 of them. And I remember anticipating the inaugural service of that church. We started with 13 people and in October 2008. And in January 2009, we had 266 in attendance, one baptism, two people got restored to the Lord, and one person placed membership at that inaugural service. It was an incredible, incredible time. I also remember going to my first GLC. And uh, that was entitled, Follow the Fire. It was a conference up in Portland, Oregon. And uh, I personally was an angry, bitter, what we call remnant disciple. And, uh, you know, remnant can be negative or positive, depending on how you look at it. The remnant disciples are the veterans. They've been around. And they've been through it. And they've been burned and survived. And yet, uh, what I was choosing in that moment was to throw away all my hope in Jesus. Um, I chose to be angry. I chose to be bitter about the things that happened to me in the years preceding that. And consequently, I was dead spiritually when I attended that first conference. And what happened is Jesus had always protected me. But then I got burned. I was like a baby whose daddy just dropped him for the first time. And so you kick and scream. But most importantly, I took control of my life back so no one else would ever hurt me again. And I remember going to the conference, it was so life-changing. And uh, of course, be, being angry and hurt, I, I wanted to hear something that gave me hope again. But I had such a criticalness in my heart that it was hard for anything to get in there. But then I heard what I had come to hear. I heard that at that conference they said, we're preparing one man to go just him and his family, not even with a mission team, to another city and to take that city for Jesus. And I said, all right, I'm in. Because I had lost my family. You know, at this last week's GLC, we saw our family. Is that not phenomenal? You know, mo many of you are very young Christians. You didn't even really know what you were a part of until the GLC this week. You got to see your family. It was like a big family reunion. All these cousins you never knew that you had. And they didn't even speak your language. And yet they had the same spirit, the same love, the same hope, and the same Lord, and the same baptism. It's like a taste of heaven when you go to the GLC. I also remember back uh, moving here to Los Angeles. After that first conference in Portland, two weeks later, I, I quit my career, quit my job, and moved to Portland two weeks later. And, uh, and then I remember being asked to move back to Los Angeles to be with a group of 12 remnant disciples. And guess what? They were angry and bitter and had lost hope and were dead spiritually. And, and so I went to be with them. And that little group of angry, bitter people became this church. Is that not amazing? Wow. I mean, for me, when I went to the GLC this weekend, I saw that that little group of people became all that we saw at that GLC. What a phenomenal thing to see. And so, with all that in mind, the title of today's lesson is The Movement's First GLC. We're going to take a look at the day of Pentecost. Okay. And, and of course, the very first church service had to be a GLC. It was definitely a global leadership conference. Yep. And, and yet, uh, there were some prophecies about this that I want us to read to set the tone. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Okay, come on, Ron. 2 Samuel chapter 7, come verse 8. Come on, Ron. Come on, Ron. This happens 
between the years 931 and 722 B.C. And Samuel's going to describe what's going to happen on the day of Pentecost. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tendering the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone. I have cut off all your enemies from before you. That'd be a good prayer to have. Amen. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I'll provide a place for my people Israel. And will plant them so that they can have a home of their own. And no longer be disturbed. Sounds like a pretty cool place. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I have appointed... Whoa. New Bible. Sorry. Appointed them leaders over my people, Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over... And you rest with your ancestors. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you. It's talking about Jesus right there. Your own flesh and blood. And I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod wielded by men with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Describes a pretty awesome place. You know, as you walked amongst your brothers and sisters at the GLC, you were in that place, that pasture. There was no one oppressing you. There was no one wronging you, maybe. We're all sinners. But it was a safe place. This is a safe place because this is God's kingdom. If you're visiting today, we're so happy to have you here. Welcome to our family. Go to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. And if you're visiting, you are going to get a picture of what we're all about here today. We just had a conference last week with all the leadership from all of our churches around the world who all came in to celebrate and worship and train together and get unified on a worldwide scale. The amazing thing about that, guys, is that I challenge you to find a church that will pull together and truly get unified on a worldwide scale, who will share all their resources in one pot, to, just to have a church that can win this world. It's amazing that the only way the world will be won is through our unity. Our unity gives us power. And yet, the very thing that keeps anyone from evangelizing this world in these churches nowadays is their lack of unity with one another. Everyone's more concerned with being right than winning the world. In Joel chapter 2, verse 27, Joel also talks about what's going to happen on that day. Sticky pages. Bible says in verse 27 of chapter 2, Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shunned. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. You've got to realize, we just kind of gloss over that. This was a brand new teaching. God was only for Israel themselves, not all people. God was only for men leading, not for women leading, up until this point. He says, not only will you be a part of this,
But it will be literally not just for Israel, but for everybody. Men, women, Gentile, Israelite alike. It says your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the church said, Amen. Go to Isaiah chapter 2. You know, you go to church to church and you see so many things and yet... It's hard to find a church that's for everybody. You got black church, Korean church, first Christian church, all kinds of churches. And yet glorying in separation and segregation. And yet we all know the truth that God's kingdom it's for all people. So all people should come together. And that's what we're about. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Here's all the specifics. Isaiah said this 750 years before Jesus was born. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established. And we know, metaphorically, that every time the Bible speaks of mountains... Is, is a metaphor for a kingdom. And so we know that this is a prophecy of the coming of God's kingdom here on earth. The mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest on the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills. And who's going to be there? All nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. Now here's how it's going to happen. The law will go out from Zion. The word of the Lord will go out from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many people. You know, that's how you settle disputes. See, we think it's kicking and screaming and fighting and arguing and posting on Facebook, gathering an army of people around us. You know how, you know, you know how you're supposed to settle disputes? You break out the word of God. And you know what you find out when you get there? Both sides are wrong always in some way, shape, or form. So both people humble out, submit to the word of God, and then we're unified again. Is that not awesome? It says they'll beat their swords into plowshares. And think about that phrase. See, this was a physical kingdom where they used swords to run people through. He says instead, we're going to have plowshares. You're going to plant seeds and water and you're going to grow a crop that's going to multiply throughout the entire world they'll beat their spears into pruning hooks nation will not take up sword against nation nor will they train for war anymore wow so there's all the specifics about what we're about to read it's not all of them just a couple scriptures that are prophecies but now we're going to dig, we're going to move on to acts chapter 2 we're going to look at the beginning of our movement. The way they turn the world upside down, we're going to look at the first GLC. Let's get on into it. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Amen? Acts chapter 2. I've got four points today. And one point has four sub-points. Woo! Our first point today, the pre-GLC services. You know, two Sundays back, y'all came to church, and y'all went home, but Michael and Sharon and everyone on staff went to meetings and services to get prepared for the incredible Global Leadership Conference that we just had. See, events like this, they don't just happen overnight. They happen with great, care, great and careful planning and meeting together and unifying together. And yet I put before you today 
Every one of our services is a representation of a GLC. And they take work and preparation and unification to yep. make them incredible. That's right. Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Sounds like a meeting to me. <laughs> Suddenly a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Wow. So the service hasn't even happened, and there's some incredible things happening here. First of all, they're all together in one place. And yet we know this is the place that they met when they had the Last Supper. It is in this room that Acts 1.13 says that they all join together constantly in prayer. And yet we come to find that in preparation for things to make an awesome service, they didn't just hang out together, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, I know at Southland, we got a lot of hanging out that's going on. I see people hiking, doing this, doing that. And, and yet I hope and pray that we're not doing it without praying together. Yeah. I hope and pray that we imitate what we see in the scriptures. Yeah. That not only are we together constantly, but that we're together in prayer constantly. Amen? And so, we also know that this started early in the morning. How do we know? Because later in this chapter, we're going to come to find, they're going to say it's only 9 in the morning. Wow. This is a real new teaching. They got up really early. You know, if we want to have an incredible service, we got to get up really early in the morning, amen? Preach. Now, I'm going to... I'm just going to throw it. This is what we call throwing a dagger, right? I'm going to throw a little dag couple daggers right here, okay? So, I got a pet peeve. I just want to put before you guys. I just need to ask for some help on it, okay? I love our services. I want them to be incredible. I don't know. You, you want them to be incredible, phenomenal, like off the charts? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Because a, a great evangelist, I don't consider myself great, but if I'm striving for that, preaches on a topic until it's fixed. And at 10 a.m. is when the first note hits. So you can ask the singers. They're like, D yeah, it's 10, start. <laughs> but you know, the service ain't awesome if only half of us are here. Are you telling me that the best you can do for the Lord and his kingdom is to come an hour late, a half an hour late? We got to get committed and we got to get surrendered to the Lord our God and come here to worship. Amen. You got more inside of you. You are all better than coming to service late consistently week after week. And I want to call each of us today that comes late to repent today. To honor the Lord our God and to get up early, have a nice time of prayer, maybe with somebody else like we see here, and come to worship service ready to sing with all of our heart on the very first note. Amen? Awesome. And then if it's fixed, I won't ever have to say that again. That's pretty awesome. Now, the day we're reading about here was the day of Pentecost. It's very important because Pentecost Day means the 50th day from Passover. And the interesting thing is that that's our Sunday. Not, not the Jewish Sunday. It's our Sunday on our calendar. And so Pentecost is historically and symbolically related to the Jewish Harvest Festival of Shabbat, which commemorates the giving of the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, 50 days after the Exodus. And, and so it's a very special day that our movement started. And, and Yet right here we come to find there was these winds that filled the whole house. You know, while Jesus walked the earth, he represented the Spirit of God. He embodied the Spirit of God. And yet God could not send his Holy Spirit to dwell amongst men and to live in their hearts until he went back up to heaven. And, and so we come to find that this is the point in time that his Spirit came down and began to dwell in the apostles. And so they began to speak in other tongues. Now here's where some false teachings come in. 
The first false teaching is that speaking in tongues is an utterance. And that is gibberish, that only the person speaking and only those who are in tune with the Spirit can understand. That's garbage. Okay? Speaking in tongues is speaking another language that you've not been trained to speak. That everyone can understand that knows that language. It's not a special thing between two people that have the Holy Spirit or not. And the Bible says that tongues, they did have tongues. Uh, and they are a gift that could be passed, but it also said that tongues would cease. And they ceased when the Bible came into existence. The other false doctrine that has come from all of this is um, from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And that is that our services should be on Saturdays. And yet, here we come to find the very first church service of God's movement was on our Sunday. Is that not awesome? And so, we do worship accordingly. And here's the bottom line of the truth of Scripture in this regard, is that Jesus was the Lord of the Sabbath. Yeah. So we can have church on Saturday, we can have church on Sunday, just like he healed people on the Sabbath. We can have church on the Sabbath any day of the week that we choose. God gives us the freedom to do that. So we want to make sure that we understand the specialness of what we teach and what we're a part of. Brothers and sisters, do you remember when you received the Holy Spirit? Do you remember that day you went down under the water? Wasn't it cool, the GLC video, to see that dude come out of the water in slow motion? It's like, yeah! Man, I remember mine. I got baptized at 1.30 in the morning in the Pacific Ocean down in Newport Beach on March 20th, 1993. It's an incredible time. And, uh, you know, I was, a I was a terrible son growing up. And uh, I had gone to church with my mom uh, our whole life. So we went to a Baptist church. And, uh, you know, I was just, I became a terrible son. I thought of my mother as a hypocrite. And uh, because everybody was a hypocrite in my mind. And I spent my time after going through in a very abusive childhood trying to disprove that God even existed. And so I became very angry and bitter with my mother and with my father. And yet, I remember that day, the last hour before my baptism, just sitting with my mother, apologizing for what a horrible son I'd become. I remember how grateful I was coming out of that water, having the Holy Spirit, knowing that I could stay changed, finally. Yeah. It's an incredible time. Don't ever lose in your heart what happened to you that day. Yeah. Keep it very close every single day. These men were powerful. These women were powerful. They changed the world in their generation. But it took pre-service meetings and preparation and unity to make all that happen. Every morning, I want to charge you to spend great time with the Lord. Right here is the physical foreshadowing of what we do when we have our times with the Lord. See, for them... They had walked with the Lord for three years. And His Spirit just went into them, filling them up. And they did incredible things because of that. But His Spirit already lives in you if you're a baptized disciple. It's already there for you. You just got to fan it into flame every day. So you read your Bible. You pray to your God. You lean on Him. You put all your anxieties on Him. And you come out powerful and ready to change this world. Remember our first point every day. Have your pre-GLC meeting before you get ready to go out to change the world that day. Secondly, after they got prepared, they came to service. It was time for the sermon. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. The Bible says, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and address the crowd. Well, wait a minute here. We know that there were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven here. So we know that he was standing in a city. We know that they had not invented microphones. They had no speakers. There was no bumping. There was no... Doom, 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 doom. None of that going on yet. There was nothing to amplify the voice. Do you know what it takes... 
for a man, one man, to raise his voice above thousands? It takes a really good quiet time, that's what it takes. It takes the full measure of the Spirit. See, right now, for those of us who've been baptized and have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is measured. We go, oh God, I pray for a double portion of your Spirit, right? Why? Because it's measured. Some of us are known to be full of the Holy Spirit all the time. Some of us are known to not. Yet, how much of the Spirit you fan into flame is totally up to you. And it's totally dictated by how much time you spend with God. And so Peter right here chose full. Yeah. He's going to give a cranking sermon that we're going to read right here. It had four points. The first point, see these are the four sub points, right? Okay. Point number two, the sermon. His first point was salvation is for everyone. Yeah. See, this is a message that we have to have on our hearts. That's taken from verses 14 through 21 that we're going to read. Come on. Come on, bro. His second point came from just simply verse 22. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He is the one to save you. Yeah. And then his third point came from verses 23 through 37. You killed the Messiah. Now, that's a pretty powerful point. Yeah. Yeah. And his fourth point was pretty simple. Repent and be baptized. On, we'll, and we'll see how effective that was when we get to the end of the chapter. Let's get on to reading Peter's sermon here. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all you who live in Jerusalem, because now it's for everybody, right? Let me explain this to you. And this needs to be the way we address people. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. See that scripture we just read. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows, this billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. See, that was a prophecy that was read about this day. It was prophesied almost a thousand years before. Wow. And here it is coming true, being preached. Yeah. See, Jesus had proven himself by miracles, wonders, and signs. You know, today we just saw one be restored to the Lord. That was incredible. I remember seeing her face dragging when she came in. And she was beaming. And she wanted to hide it. She's a little nervous up here, but, but that's okay. She has a big smile. It was cool seeing her dance at the, at the dance, all the pictures and everything. Go, man, the GLC changed her. You know why the GLC changed her? Because she let it change her. Because she softened her heart. And she took it all in. And yet right here as we move into Peter's second point of his sermon, Jesus is the Christ, verse 22. All right. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. See, Jesus is the Christ. He is the truth. He is the way. He is the life. And yet, there's all this new teaching that Jesus isn't the Messiah. That there was a sun god born, and we're just a false imitation of an old religion that enslaved black people. You know, I'm half black, so I was half mad about that. I got jokes sometimes. I'm not always serious. I can't dance, but I can play some ball. So, but you know, Jesus is the truth. 
And this is very important because some of you don't believe that he's the truth. I mean, when it comes down to it, when he says forgive, do you just forgive? Or do you have to have a, a valid reason in your mind to forgive? See, he is the truth, and his way does work. When he says seek first the kingdom, seek first his kingdom. Don't seek first work. Don't seek first school. Don't seek first getting a relationship. Seek first the kingdom, and all these things will be given, it says. That's Jesus' promise to you. Yet we got to grab the promise. we got to hold on to the promise. See, what happens is we dabble in a little sin, and then we stop believing the promise. And then we go, well, this guy wronged me. That's a good excuse. Because I'm in sin. and I, I, no, I, What she said to me is just wrong. Because we just don't want to admit that we had a little sin in our life. Just get it out. You'll feel a whole lot better. You won't feel guilty no more. You won't have to blame anybody. You just get it on out, and then, oh, it's amazing when you read, wow, well, yeah, it's the truth, yeah, I should do this. It's pretty cool. It's so easy to not believe that Jesus is the way. Right. It's, everything else is put before you as the way. The most interesting man in the world makes it look like that's the way to go. All these commercials and movies, it's crazy. And yet Jesus is the way. But in order to understand the way, you've got to read about the way. You've got to study about the way. And then you've got to try the way, because it's a try it before you buy it thing. So you won't believe it until you actually try it. And when you try it, you'll finally see it work. But when you stop trying it, then you go, oh, that was junk. And you throw it away again. So you've got to understand Peter's second point and hold it close to your heart. Jesus is the way. Thirdly, I mean, wow. Can you imagine if this was a point in one of my sermons? You killed the Messiah. Verse 23. He says, This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. You go, I didn't do that. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. It says, but God raised him from the dead. See how that works right there? We're so afraid if we obey the Bible, we're going to die. Because we forget that God's going to raise us to, from the dead. See, Abraham was the father of faith because God said, kill your son. And he's like, how am I not saying? Okay, he'll raise him from the dead. Okay. See, see but we've got to imitate our father's faith. And the ones who've come before us. You're not going to die if you seek the kingdom first. You're not going to die if you give your last dollar for contribution because you wasted it on Starbucks or whatever it is. You're going to live because you obey God. And no circumstance on earth can change that. He will take care of you. End of story. You go, I need, how's he going to do it? I don't know. That is not my job. I don't know. My job is not to know how he's going to work. My job is just to help you understand he's going to. He keeps his promises. It says, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. For David said about it, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Woo! What shakes you? Woo! What, what, what does it to you? Somebody mistreats you? Oh! Somebody look at you weird? What is it that shakes you? Come on, bro. But more importantly, we all get shaken in some ways. You want to shake me? Hurt my kid. That's, I'm trying to get past where that shakes me. It, it does. You, you know, we all have our thing. But more importantly, what makes you feel secure? Is it that you're saved and, you, and God is at your right hand? Or is it your awesome friends? Is it the great discipling that you get in our church? The great counseling. You get to lay back on the sofa and tell somebody all your problems. And just get it all out. Everything that's supposed to be talked about in your quiet time. 
and, you, and put it all on a man, and because they tell you it's going to be fine, now you feel good? What is it for you? Where are you putting your trust? It's great to hang out all the time together. But if you hang out and don't pray, that's how it's going to be. And then when they let you down, oh, that church. That church. You know. We haven't had a few people leave recently. And when you ask them why, they go, because I got in a conflict with somebody. And I was like, I call them back a few weeks later. Do you know that the person you had conflict with is gone? And you're still saying that church? And they ain't even part of the church anymore. That's one of the benefits of being around 20-some years. Is that you get to see the people who inflict pain on person after person eventually leave when they won't repent. How sad to leave for a person and come to find out they weren't even really a true disciple in the end because you didn't hang out long enough to find out. Today understand this message. All of our sin kills Jesus. All of our sin did it. You know, he moves on here in the, after not being shaken, he says, therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest in hope. Man, when you trust the Lord and you have great times with him, you sleep so good. The whole world can be falling apart and... My wife sleeps really good. I, didn't, I did not say she sounded like that. I didn't say that. She does, but amen. I heard I do too, though, so amen. Match made in heaven. But see, when God is your rock, when he is your savior, when he is what makes you feel calm and secure, you sleep so good. And you can get up so early because of that. And you're fired up to get with the Lord and learn to have even more peace. Even if you feel at peace right now, I want you to know you can feel more peace than you could ever imagine. More than you're feeling right now. But it's amazing why he says he rejoices. Verse 27. Because you will not abandon me to the grave. Your God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never abandon you to the grave. No one can take your salvation. No one can ruin it for you. It is yours. But you can give it up. I pray you understand how special it is so you don't ever consider giving it up. He says, you have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Now here he goes. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the partridge David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. Now wasn't he just calling David like one of the greatest men who lived in the other scripture? It's amazing right here. It says, but he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Man, if all of a sudden the, one of the greatest men ever is reduced to just that, how much greater is Jesus? It says, See, seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life, and we're all witnesses of the fact. You didn't see Jesus raised from the dead. You weren't able to touch the holes in his hand. To keep from doubting. But know what he gave you so that you would know he raised from the dead? He gave you your testimony. And raised you from the dead the same way. Yeah. It says, exalted to the right hand of God, verse 33. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. And has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven. And yet he said. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Wow, dude. Anybody got any enemies? Anybody got anybody that's wronged them and harmed them or keeps doing it? 
You know, we're supposed to sit until God makes our enemies a footstool. Oh, the day, let me tell you, there's a good saying that you need to remember. Every dog has its day. And your enemy has its day with the Lord. All you got to do is stay close to him, sit at his right hand, and wait and pray and pray and pray. And one day, oh, it's coming. And you know what's going to come on that day? You're going to wish you could save that enemy because of what the Lord will do to them. Because the Lord deals with those who harm his kids. And so you sit and you wait and you wait and you better be ready and fill yourself with love because that day when he smashes that enemy, go get him and save him and help them experience the change life. But you know why we don't take responsibility for killing Jesus like this? Because we got issues. I don't know. I got issues. You got it? Anybody in here got issues? I got issues too. That, there you go. That's the church right there. Issues. I don't know what your issues are, but I've had daddy issues in my life. So what happens when you got issues is that you don't take responsibility for the things that you do that are out of line or wrong. Because you just focus on your issue. Because your issue is worse than what you did. It's called a smoke screen. I am not here. Nothing I did happened. It was not me. It was you. And yet, we're all guilty of the, the biggest and worst sin ever. We killed Jesus. Our sin. Our undealt with, unrepented of, unforgiven sin killed Jesus. You know, even my, my earlier years as a disciple, I was so fired up. and I mean, I went two years totally pure. I didn't look at anything. I didn't lust nothing for two years straight. It was like awesome. But then I had daddy issues, and it messed it all up. Because I had daddy issues, I had authority issues. And so no one could tell me what to do. You know, tell me, tell me, let me tell you what to do. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I kind of lived there for a number of years. And everybody had an agenda in my mind because I had daddy issues. Everybody wanted something because I had daddy issues. And there came a day finally when I actually had to forgive my dad. Because you will be untrusting and rebellious until you actually forgive. The Lord will not let you function normally until you forgive. And I came to realize something about my dad. He was a non-Christian. He didn't know Jesus. And he didn't have the standard of the Bible, so he didn't know how to act straight. He got overwhelmed with different things, and what came out is what came out. And I finally realized something. I was a Christian. I had the truth. I had been changed, but not enough to change him yet, because I hadn't forgiven him. And what I realized that day I wrote a letter to him on Father's Day. And it kind of started out like this. You did this to me, you did that to me, you did this and that, and da 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 And then I had the scripture, honor your father. And, I, and, it, and it hit me like a ton of bricks that day. Doggone it, it doesn't say honor your father unless. Did somebody erase that? It just says honor him, but he doesn't deserve honor. But God says he does, no matter what he did. No wonder my life's so messed up. Like, wow, okay. Erase everything I just wrote. Whew. Okay. Hmm, you taught me to work hard. 
At that point, I was making about $40,000 a year, no high, just a high school diploma. And I was like, hmm, okay, that's because of him. <laughs> I'd give you the shirt off my back. Okay, that came from him. Yeah. And, and, then it, and then it just started flowing. All that I got from my father. And I went, wow, he's a pretty good guy. <laughs> But what I realized most, he did wrong me greatly. He did wrong my mother greatly. And yet, as a Christian, I wronged him like crazy. I dishonored him. I thought badly about him. I spoke badly about him. Therefore, I could not own that I killed Jesus when it came to that. I could not own that my disrespect killed Jesus. And that there was no excuse for it. No matter what wrong was done to me, I did more to Jesus. No matter how much was put on me, I put Jesus on the cross. Everything that anyone has ever done to me, I realized that day, I did to Jesus and worse, even after I knew the truth. No, I didn't have all the outward immorality and all kinds of stuff going on anymore. But I had sin, even though I knew Jesus. Yeah. See, my father hit me many times growing up. I know what it's like to be beaten and bleed. And yet, Jesus got, was beaten and bled. For me, far worse, to the point of death. Yeah. My father hit me, yet I slapped Jesus across the face every time I ignored his word. My father verbally abused me, and yet I tried to disprove God even existed. I cursed disciples. I threw food at disciples that tried to share with me. And I wanted to say, my father emotionally abused me while I'm chasing disciples through the campus. <laughs> Mr. Philosopher, God doesn't exist because I'm angry. When Jesus needed me most to not sin so that he didn't have to be killed, I chose sin anyway, and I killed him. We are responsible. Yeah. We did kill him. And with that, he said, okay, I'll die that death, because God's going to raise me from the dead, and I'm going to save you. Whew. It's time to let it all go. It's time to let it all go today. He says, verse 36, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Yeah. Peter's last point in his sermon was repent and be baptized. Let's go to verse 38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, most of you. <laughs> Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. Well, let's see how effective this sermon was. It says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise for you, for all your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. In other words, the entire planet. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. What an incredible day. See, verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Woo! See, we blame shift so much, we even put on the preacher whether we get cut to the heart or not. If I'm the most terrible speaker on the planet and I read you even one scripture, that should cut your heart. Yeah. That's our responsibility before the Lord. Why do I got to pretty it up and make it interesting? And God's word is God's word. It's what makes change. If I do anything eloquent, that should not be what changes you. What should change you is the simple truth of the scriptures and the fact Jesus died for you and it's written down for you to read. See, 
cut to the heart is a matter of what you decide. If you decided today, it's time for my life to change, well, today is your day. You're already cut to the heart if that's your day. And you're already ready. And after this sermon, get with who brought you and study the Bible and get baptized and get the forgiveness of your sins. And then life starts. If you're already a disciple, no longer should we hear, how you doing? Well, you know, I don't know. I'm just here. You know what one of the saddest moments of the GLC was for me? Because I'm in charge of all the sand, the AV stuff and the sound and all that, I get called to go from room to room and here to there all over. And we're at, we're at the GLC, the final sermon, and Kip's up there just laying it out. And I get, bro, there's a problem. You need to go to the other room. And I was like, oh, come on, dude. So I walk out of the room and I get to the hallway, and it was the saddest moment of the GLC for me to see the hallway filled with people. Not in there with everybody. They're the same ones that are not ever cut to the heart. In the back, talking with each other. Hey, what's up? Yeah, yeah, nothing. Yeah. Trying to find something to do. Just, just present, but not with us. I challenge you. You see one of these people walking around? Go get them. Bring them back to their seat. Right. Help them hear the word of God. Yeah. Let's keep each other strong. Let's really be fair. There should be no wandering around when it's time to worship. There should be no little talks having outside. None of us have anything more important than worshiping God together. Oh. Lastly, is the response of the people in verse 41. The response is always the same. Be baptized, or repent, or both. You know, uh, we're about to read about their devotion. And it was incredible. And yet, I want to call you today. If you're here, it's no mistake you're here. I want to call you to the same exact devotion that we're about to read right now. Everyone in God's kingdom, regardless of their role or age or color or job, has the same calling, the same commitment, the same devotion. There's no difference between paid ministry and someone who's not paid ministry. Bible talk leader, discipler, disciple whatever, without all these terms we use, we all are called to the same level of commitment. Let's read this level of commitment together. Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. There will be no excuse you can give to God when you go to stand before Him if you aren't in awe of His kingdom and His word. There's no hurt that you can have that somebody inflicted upon you that you can go to God and say, that's why I didn't have awe. Because that means your focus is not God anymore. It means your focus is people. And if your focus is people, you're never going to have awe. You're never going to have the heart of a child, and you'll never be able to enter God's kingdom like that. He says, they are all filled with awe and many wonders and signs were performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone as he had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Absolute, unequivocal devotion. We have no problem being devoted to fellowship in our region. Y'all love hanging out together. Y'all love doing things together. And yet, too many of you love hanging out together without spending time with God together. And it's time that we really inject God into every aspect of what we're doing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Don't 
ever go on a walk up the mountain and not pray on the mountain? Don't ever go on a date and not pray. Thank God that we can date purely and righteously and encourage one another. Don't ever meet together without talking about your kingdom dreams. What you want God to do with your life. What he's doing with your life. What you're learning and reading and studying. Do those things and then talk about what's on Facebook. Let me tell you, if you do the spiritual things first, when you get to the Facebook part, you'll be like, hey, this garbage got to stop on Facebook. You'll start to use it for better things and bigger things. You know, they were devoted to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread. You know, after this, we're about to take communion together. We're about to break bread together as a family. See, we do this as one man, as one family all together at one time. And the purpose of it is that in one moment in time throughout the week, we have all decided that there is nothing we have against anybody, no problem, no complaint, no anything, that we, all, that we, we in one moment wipe it all away. And we not only know we have that clean slate with the Lord, but we also give clean slate to everyone around us. And anything that's ever happened to us, what a powerful thing. Do you know why they changed the world? Partly because they were devoted to the breaking of bread wow. and of keeping clean hearts with God and with each other. Today, as you take communion, be devoted. Don't think so highly of yourself that you think you can have something against someone. That there's some sin that somebody committed against you that doesn't deserve forgiveness to, because then you say that you don't deserve forgiveness before God. And when you don't forgive, when you don't give it, you don't feel forgiven. I want all of you to feel forgiven so that you can know what it's like to be powerful in the face of this world. See, you can raise your voice against thousands. You can raise the banner like we did at the GLC. You don't need, your, you don't need a GLC to do all these things. You just need this. You need a great time with the Lord, a great time with each other, and devotion to all the things the Bible says. And then you think about it. Who are these people that were doing all this? They were all baby Christians. <laughs> the Bible says there's about 500 believers that day, and they baptized 3,000 people. You know, I'll never forget... This GLC, standing in line with Trey, waiting to, for his baptism. And man, it was like there was just a line of people all the way around the room waiting to be baptized. And there's like 12 of them. <laughs> Can you imagine 3,000 of them? Like, woo! Dang! How'd they do that? A really long church service, that's how they did it. Do you think there was anybody wandering around the back while it was happening? Do you think there was anybody just taken off early? Because they had things to do? No. Their focus was God. It was here. And we got Jan Danielle Collette here with us today as well. She's raising the banner in Chicago, but visiting us here today. It's awesome. These were a bunch of baby Christians. You know, I want to give you the baby Christian challenge today. You see, I've been around 20 years. Then be a baby Christian today. Be devoted to the fellowship. Be devoted to the breaking of bread. Be devoted to prayer. Be devoted to your God. It's interesting. They said that they, uh, they sold their possessions. You know, we just got done raising all kinds of money. First for... Special and then for GLC is pretty awesome. You know, if we were to take all the money in the planet and stick it all together, there wouldn't be enough money to save everybody. You go, so when's it going to end? When Jesus comes. That's when it's going to end. When's the need going to be less? When Jesus comes. That's when the need's going to be less. And so, you know, we waited kind of till the last minute to try and raise all this money. And so it was like a last-minute thing. I was so proud of all you guys. 
Three weeks, we raised $90,000 in three weeks. I mean, that was like bold. But I don't know about you, I, I don't want to wait till the last minute the next time we raise money. All right? So we just found out at this GLC that what the need is for the next mission teams and whatnot in Thanksgiving is 10 times what we give each week. We go, whoa, again? Yeah, again. It's pretty, yes. whoo. Man, I'm so grateful that the Lord gives me the ability to give and raise money. But I want to get on top of this. And so we're going to give it in November. It's 10 times. But, you know, if you take what we give as a collective group, right, a little over 4000 a week, and you multiply that times 10, it's about $40,000. Now, if you extrapolate out each part doing its work, right, because if you're giving out of your paycheck, you know, amen, but I don't know, I'd rather just raise it yeah. and not take anything out of my pocket. And so if we all fundraise, we can all take an equal part in raising the money. And so if we go out, if every person goes out and does the tagging like once every two weeks, Everybody's getting about 60 bucks a person. And if we give on average $25 a week extra from now until November, or like 50 every two weeks, because we go and tag once and we get 50 to $60 and give that once every two weeks, we'll blow out the goal. It's that simple. We'll blow it out. Once every two weeks, you take a few hours out of your time to fundraise, and we do that consistently from now till then. If we keep doing it till we keep doing it until next April, and then be done fundraising. What if the last three months before GLC there's no more fundraising? So we just keep knocking that out every couple of weeks from now until April. We'll blow it out by a long shot, and have everything that we need for the kingdom, and nothing comes out of our pockets. Then we could, if we want to just tag, we can tag to get rid of debt, so we can roll on mission teams. How about that? And so that's part of getting things ready, preparing early. And so today, remember the GLC. Remember the first GLC. It took great pre-GLC meetings. It takes a great sermon that I hope you have in your heart and ready to go out to the world and preach. And it takes being cut to the heart and relying on Jesus. Today, that's Acts chapter 2. I hope it inspired you. I hope you're ready to change this world. Next week, Acts chapter 3. I love you all very much.